Lecture two of the World of Sound by Sir William Bragg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sound in Music. We have been thinking of sound as a means of communication, or as something which accompanies most movements and gives information about them to ears that listen. Today we want to consider sound from another point of view. It is a fact that certain sounds and certain successions of sounds are very pleasing to our senses. In order to produce them, we make musical instruments. Let us consider some of the simpler rules of construction that must be followed if we are to be able to draw from the instruments the melody and harmony that we like to hear. The first thing that we have to do is to learn how to make a sound that remains for some time unchanged, that has, as we say, a definite pitch. Perhaps one of the first notes of this kind that men listened to was the twang of the bowstring, and this may have been the beginning of all the stringed instruments. Let us ask ourselves what is the real distinction between such a steady note and an irregular noise such as the coal man makes when he empties his sack on the pavement the one sound is of the kind of which music can be made nothing at all can be done with the other i will try to make the difference clear in the following way if i wave my hand towards you a pulse travels away in the air at a great rate eleven hundred feet a second as we have already seen but it makes no impression on your ears. They have no power to detect a single pulse like that. If I were to wave my hand as fast as I could, there would still be no resulting sound. But if I could wave it fifty times a second, your ears would be filled with a deep booming noise. There must, in fact, be a sufficiently rapid succession of pulses before the ear hears. As I cannot myself move anything so quickly as that, we must have recourse to some mechanical method of carrying out the experiment. Instead of sending a pulse to you by moving my hand, I will cause a pulse to be sent out into the air by suddenly opening a hole behind which is compressed air, ready to force itself out into the open. The instrument I am going to use has been called a siren. There is a cylindrical box in the lid of which are cut small holes out of which the air is to come, and the box is in communication with the organ bellows. Just above the lid is a metal disc which, as you see, can turn round freely. The disc also is pierced with holes, and when the holes in the top disc are just over the holes in the lid, air spurts through them all at the same time and makes one of those pulses which are going to be linked together in a sound. Figure 17. This figure shows the siren with its revolving disc and counting mechanism. The siren stands on a wind chest. The disc has four rings of holes, any one of which can be set in action by pressing the proper key. As the disc is made to turn round, the series of holes is alternately open and shut, all of them acting together, and so a set of pulses is sent out into the air in regular succession. When the disc spins slowly, you can hear the separate puffs. As a matter of fact, each puff is accompanied by a little whistling noise, such as always goes with the issue of compressed air and that is why you hear anything at all of the individual puff. But of the main shove given to the air, your ears are quite unconscious. If I leave the disc alone after giving it a little start, and keep up the supply of air under pressure, the speed of the disc rapidly increases. That is because the little holes are so cut in a slanting fashion that the issuing air drives the top disc round. Figure 18. This figure shows a section of the moving and fixed discs along the line AB. The holes in the discs are so shaped that the upper disc is driven round by the blast of air. Now the important thing to observe is that as soon as the speed increases sufficiently, 
we begin to be aware of a very deep note as it goes faster and faster the note rises in pitch and finally ends in a shrill scream it is really because the successive puffs are all like one another and because they succeed each other sufficiently fast that the ear hears a sound of definite pitch we find too that the more rapid the succession the higher the note here then is the whole difference between an irregular noise and a note we find that in whatever way we make pulses start off in the air if only the number of them that start off in a second is regular and sufficient the ear hears a note and the pitch of it depends on how many there are in a second if i can arrange for some operation no matter what it may be to be repeated two hundred times a second i shall always get the note of that frequency and conversely whenever a note of that pitch is heard it is quite certain that something or other is being done two hundred times a second the siren gave that note when it revolved so fast that in every second there were two hundred puffs here is a set of cogged wheels driven by an electric motor i can hold a card to one of the wheels so that as it turns the card flops continually from one tooth to the next each time it does so it makes a little disturbance in the air and starts a pulse on its travels when the wheel turns fast enough the succession of pulses makes a note which is higher the faster the wheel is turned when two hundred teeth pass under the card in the second we get the same note as before there are eight wheels on the axis of the electro-motor and the numbers of the teeth on the different wheels are twenty-four twenty-seven thirty thirty-two thirty-six forty forty-five forty-eight notice in passing that as they are touched in succession with the card we get the notes of the ordinary musical scale and this is so no matter how fast the motor is turning the wheel of forty-eight teeth always gives the octave above the wheel of twenty-four teeth clearly the octave depends on the two to one ratio the wheels of thirty-six and twenty-four teeth are a fifth apart the ratio three to two belongs to the interval of the fifth we find in this way that all the intervals of the musicians correspond to definite numerical ratios figure nineteen electric motor and rapidly revolving toothed wheels the numbers of teeth on the wheels are so related to each other that the notes of the scale are given when a card is placed on the wheels successively when two wheels are geared into one another as in the gearbox of a motor car each time the teeth of one wheel enter and leave the spaces of another there is a tiny shock which starts a quiver in the metalwork of the car and in turn a pulse into the air the better made the wheels the more silent is their play but there is always a little hum and the driver instinctively listens to it because it tells him whether the car is running smoothly and whether it is altering its speed the note of the hum tells how many teeth pass each other in a second when a motor car with a studded tire goes past on a wooden or asphalt pavement there is often a shrill scream which comes from the tapping of the studs on the road and the note tells you how many taps take place per second here is a piece of ribbed silk if i draw my fingernail over it each time the nail slips into a depression between two of the ridges it starts a little pulse this happens many hundreds of times a second and a shrill sound is caused thereby i cannot get the same effect from a piece of soft cloth because the separate little risings and fallings of the fingernail are only made with sufficient sharpness and intensity on the hard ridges of the silk so also when two pieces of silk rub together little shrill sounds are made with which we are all familiar when we were very small we may have puzzled ourselves over them 
as stevenson says in his child's garden of verses whenever auntie moves around her dresses make a curious sound they trail behind her up the floor and trundle after through the door in the same way we get a note when we draw the finger across the cover of a book provided it has a regular succession of ridges and hollows but when the material has irregular depressions all over it we have only a noise in which we can recognize no pitch when we tear a piece of calico the regular successive breaking of the threads causes a corresponding succession of pulses in the air by way of the jerking motions of the material and the hands and there is a sound of definite pitch which rises if we tear faster in general the sensitiveness to high-pitched sounds weakens with age it is quite usual to find that old people cannot hear the shrill squeak of a bat the late francis galton was very interested in observing the range of hearing possessed by different ears and used a specially high-pitched whistle for the purpose of determining the upper limit to many people very high sounds are all alike they can tell that there is a sound but can assign no pitch to it at the extreme low frequency end of the range of hearing there is a special difficulty in recognizing by the ear the existence of a note because the body can actually feel the vibration when the lowest notes of an organ are sounding in a church it is often doubtful whether we really detect any sound or whether we merely feel the shaking of the pews if then i want to make a musical instrument i must find some mechanism which can conveniently be made to do something over and over again at the rate required for each different note there are ever so many ways in which this can be done but there are two or three which have been found far more convenient than the rest and first we may consider the vibrating string if we stretch a string between two points and then taking hold of the middle pull it to one side and let go it swings backwards and forwards for a long time making hundreds of vibrations as we call them before it finally comes to rest that is the sort of thing we want it would be no use if when we pulled it aside it stayed where we put it or even if it slowly went back to its first position it has to be like a pendulum when the bob is pulled to one side and let go its weight carries it down to the central position but it does not stop there the way which it has gathered carries it through and it climbs up the other side till the effort exhausts its energy then it falls back again and so a continual to and fro movement is set up the string like the pendulum rushes back to its central position overswings itself reaches a limiting position on the other side recoils and repeats the motion again and again it is very important to observe that both string and pendulum take the same length of time over each swing no matter whether that swing is large or small vibrating or oscillating bodies of whatever kind most commonly obey this rule and it is very fortunate for us that it is so suppose for a moment that the rate of vibration altered as the swing diminished imagine trying to play on a piano if the pitch of the note depended on how hard one struck it and changed as the sound died away if the bob of the pendulum is set swinging in water it soon stops because the energy is given to the water and wasted in little eddies and whirls when the pendulum swings in the air there are eddies also but relatively the waste of energy is far less a vibrating string causes little disturbance in the air because it is so thin and slips through so easily very little of its energy is given out in this way but as it moves it shakes its supports and these again anything on which they stand and all these motions mean a gradual frittering away of the energy of the string 
figure twenty the upper part of the figure shows the monochord which is used for the study of the vibrations of the string the lower part of the figure shows the form of the string while vibrating there is one way in which we particularly want the energy to spread itself and that is in pulses through the air in order to get these well under way it is usual to mount one or other of the supports of the string on a broad surface which when made to vibrate has a large effect on the air which is in contact with it this surface is called a sounding board if you remember our previous experiment with the musical box you will appreciate its importance here is a string which is suspended from a bracket on the wall and is tightly stretched by the large weight attached to it figure twenty one this string when made to vibrate does not give out much sound it is not mounted on a sounding board if it is plucked it vibrates freely but there is very little noise in the case of the monochord the string is mounted on its proper sounding board when it vibrates we hear it well the sounds that you hear when a violin is played come really from the body of the violin not from the strings and because the body is apt to alter the quality of the notes which originally come from the string and because it is the interpretation given by the body which you really hear therefore the body has to be made most carefully and a first-class violin is a great treasure strings must be good of course but it is not the strings which are costly here again is a tuning fork figure twenty two a tuning fork mounted on its proper sounding box when it is made to vibrate it is comparatively silent unless its stem is pressed upon some surface which it can set into vibration so that strong pulses can be sent out into the air it is sometimes mounted on a sounding box of such a form as to be highly efficient for the purpose of launching the sound a string then gives a continuous note in a very convenient way notice too that we have the pitch of the string quite under command we can raise the pitch either by shortening the string or by stretching it more tightly both effects are readily shown on the monochord but a musical instrument must be capable of giving out not one but many notes and when we take the string as the basis of construction we must in some way arrange that the player shall have many strings at his command or at least be able to produce all the notes he wants from a limited number of strings the violinist uses four strings only and makes the different notes by placing his fingers on one or more of them at different points thus artificially altering their length he holds the string down firmly with his finger so that the vibrating portion reaches from that finger to the bridge all the responsibility of getting the right note is thrown on the player himself that is the way to obtain the finest most delicately shaded results in the piano and harp a different string is provided for every note that is required in one way the task of the player is very much lightened but at the same time he loses the power of making certain minute changes in pitch which are required as we shall see later for perfect music any changes of pitch which are required to put a stringed instrument into tune before playing are of course made by altering the tensions of the strings concerned there is yet one other method of obtaining several notes from one string which we can explain by means of the monochord i draw the bow across the string and bring out the lowest note which it can give if now i touch the string in the centre and bow again i get a note which is an octave higher on examining the string closely it is easy to see that each half of the string is now vibrating separately we have already learnt that when one of two notes is an octave above the other 
it makes twice as many vibrations each second and so the half string vibrates twice as fast as the whole string there is another point to be observed if i do not touch the string exactly in the middle i get no good note at all only a horrible groan which shows that the string does not care to vibrate in that way it is easy to see why the string can vibrate in two equal vibrating parts because in that case the two will always vibrate at the same rate and will always pull against each other in exactly opposite directions at the point of division between them this is necessary if the point is always to be kept at rest if the parts were unequal the string would have to get sometimes into the shape shown in the figure which would be impossible figure twenty three a a represents a momentary form of a string which is vibrating in two equal parts a string could not vibrate in two unequal parts because it would then have to take at intervals the form b b which would be impossible the lightest touch at the centre will make the string vibrate in two equal parts it is quite a natural form of vibration we call the lowest note which is that given by the whole string vibrating together the note or tone of the string we call this new note an overtone in just the same way if we touch the string exactly at one third of the distance from one end and draw the bow across it we can make the string vibrate in three equal parts the note then given is recognized by the musical ear as the fifth of the note corresponding to the division into two from the toothed wheel apparatus we can satisfy ourselves that whenever two notes are a fifth apart the upper has three vibrations or pulses to the lowers two we infer that each part of the string divided into three makes three vibrations in the same time that each part of the string divided into two parts makes two vibrations and so we go on to higher numbers it is easy to get notes making four five six etc up to twelve thirteen or more times the vibrations of the bottom note in each second so we can get many notes from one string there is a beautiful little experiment which illustrates the division into parts let us show for example the division into four i put riders of blue paper on the string at the first and second points of division of the string into four leaving the third point of division to be touched by my finger halfway between the end of the string and the first point and between the first and second points and between the second and third i mount riders of yellow paper when the string vibrates in four parts the points where the blue papers are riding are points of rest but where the yellow papers are there will be the movement of the vibration of the string so when i put my finger on the right spot and just give the slightest touch with the bow all the yellow papers are thrown off but the blue stay where they are figure twenty four showing half the riders in the act of being unseated those unshaken are at the nodes or points of rest a second very important class of musical instruments is based on the movements of columns of air contained in tubes or of masses of air contained in vessels of any form for instance here is a tall jar the air inside it may be set into vibration swinging in and out of the jar at a rate which depends mainly on the length of the jar in the case of the string we started the vibrations by pulling the string to one side and letting go after which the string continued to vibrate and radiate sound for some time we cannot do the parallel experiment with an air column or rather we cannot do it so successfully to show how much can be done i take a set of test tubes some containing water some nearly empty arranged in the order of their emptiness when i draw the corks the columns of air inside the tubes are set into vibration 
just as a string is excited by plucking it notice that as the corks are pulled out in succession we are going up the musical scale but the notes only last for a very short time in fact the energy is quickly radiated away much more quickly than in the case of the string the sound lasts long enough for you to get an idea of pitch nevertheless figure twenty five row of corked test tubes into each of which water has been poured until it gives the desired note when the cork is pulled out the order of the notes is that of the musical scale when the water is poured out from a full bottle the gurgling noise consists of a succession of short-lived notes it is readily observed that they fall in pitch as the air space becomes larger noise is made too when the bottle is filled again and in this case the pitch rises with the diminishing air space as we have occasion to observe often enough whenever for example a jug is filled at a tap it is just as easy to get a variety of notes with these vibrating air masses as it was with the strings we have to use long columns or large masses of air to get the deep notes and short columns or small masses to get the high notes if we want to make a continuous note with a mass of air we must do something more than give it a single shock we must keep the note going there are ever so many ways of doing this some of which we must look into carefully sometimes we blow across the mouth of the tube or body of air figure twenty six blowing across the mouth of a tube sets the air column into vibration i will explain later how that may set the air in the flask or tube in vigorous and continuous vibration for the present it is enough to give examples when i blow across the mouth of the test tubes it is easy to get a response which gives the same notes as we got when the corks were drawn by blowing in the right way loud notes can be obtained in organ pipes and whistles there are channels to guide the air up to and across the mouth of the pipe so that the player cannot make a mistake figure twenty seven an organ pipe and its section showing how the air is directed the flute and the fife leave the player to do the directing of the stream himself and that is why it takes a little practice to get the proper sound out of them when we make whistles out of young willow branches the art is to shape the mouthpiece rightly so that the stream of air is correctly formed and it is not always an easy thing to do when the organ builder is finishing off his pipes he has to pay his last attentions to the wooden edge on which the air stream blows often he has to score it with fine grooves in a way which long practice has shown to be successful he calls the operation voicing and considers that he has successfully accomplished his work when the sound of the pipe is pure and strong we can start the vibration of the air in the jar before you in another and more brutal way instead of coaxing it to vibrate at its own rate by blowing across the mouth i can hold a vibrating tuning fork over it of course the tuning fork is so strong that the pliant column of air has to obey its motions but the response is not very vigorous until the length of the column of air is adjusted to a proper value when this is done and the natural note of the column is the same as that of the fork there is a loud response figure twenty eight water is poured into the jar until the air column is of such length as to respond loudly to the tuning fork in that case the column is acting as an agent for the fork taking energy from it and distributing it widely the energy of the fork must be more quickly spent in consequence the movements of air columns are quite invisible and it is rather hard for a beginner to picture what is going on i have always found that it helps to consider the action of models made of long spiral springs here for example is such a spring made of iron wire 
and about fifteen feet long it is hung from the roof by a cord so that when the lower end is gently moved up and down the top stays still and the whole spring vibrates this represents the to and fro movements of the air in a jar figure twenty nine a long vibrating spiral spring with a light ball attached to it for the purpose of making the motion more obvious the movement is of the same character as that of the vibrating column of air in the jar the double arrows show roughly the amount of motion at different places and dotted lines join corresponding points if we hold the jar upside down the open end now at the bottom corresponds to the bottom end of the spring in one case there is free movement of the spring in the other of the air which can pour freely in and out of the mouth of the jar in both cases there is no motion at the top the spring's movements are so leisurely that we can count them with ease that helps us to work out a point of great importance suppose that the spring is tweaked sharply instead of being gently set in motion when the spring is quite quiet i suddenly depress the lower end four or five inches observe that it stays where it is put for a moment a pulse which i have called into being runs up the wire and down again and it is not until it returns that the spring suddenly flies back again it overshoots itself as a matter of fact and a pulse of the opposite kind runs up and down the wire if now we count how fast these sudden up and down motions succeed one another we find that the rate is just the same as when the motions were gentle pulsations of the spring so we learn that the time of vibration is governed by the time taken by a pulse to run up and down the spring between an instant when the spring is most extended and the next instant when it is again most extended a pulse can run twice up and twice down the spring so if we count the number of vibrations of the spring in that time we can find out how fast a pulse travels over the spring observe too that all sorts of pulses sharp and slow single tweaks and double tweaks any kind in fact all travel at the same rate now it is just the same for the air column and we can actually find the velocity of sound in air by measuring the length of the air column which answers to the fork and multiplying that by four and by the number of vibrations which the fork makes in a second it is sometimes very important to measure the velocity of sound in a given substance and there may be no other way of doing it than this it is very seldom that we can get enough of a substance to make it possible to give a straight course for a sound for a whole second it is only air or water or earth which gives range enough we have seen that we can get a note of any pitch from a tube of the right length and an organ builder can complete a scale of notes by putting together a sufficient number of tubes of different sizes after all that is the way in which they made the oldest organs of all the pan pipes or we may have but one pipe and alter its length as we play in the whistle the player has his fingers on a series of holes when he lifts his fingers in succession beginning at the one farthest from his lips it is as if he were gradually shortening the pipe because the effective portion reaches from the mouthpiece to the next hole which is open figure thirty one the tin whistle the figure illustrates the way in which the different notes of the scale are obtained the rest of the pipe is generally idle except in certain special cases depending on another development of the principle of the sounding pipe which we will now consider it is possible to obtain several notes out of the same tube just as we were able to obtain several notes from one length of string for instance here is a piece of glass tubing six inches long closed at one end 
by blowing across the open end i get a certain note by blowing harder another note much higher in pitch and by blowing harder still a very shrill note we have found that high notes are associated with short lengths and we may suspect that in the case of the pipes as in the corresponding case of the strings the high notes come from a subdivision of the long column into short columns it is convenient to use the spring model once more here are five spiral springs of different lengths one ten inches another twenty and others thirty forty and fifty inches of the first third and fifth springs each is attached to a fixed point at its upper end and at its lower dips into a pool of mercury the second and fourth are fixed at both ends figure thirty two the five springs are vibrating at a rate which is set by the smallest of them the longest divides into five vibrating parts each equal in length to the shortest the next into four equal parts and so on the arrows show points of maximum movement and the nodes or points of rest are denoted by the letter n an electric current runs through all the springs the same for all and the springs try to contract in consequence this is because neighbouring convolutions when traversed by the current attract one another according to a well-known electrical law now the smallest spring only just touches the mercury in its cup when it is at rest and of its normal length when it contracts the bottom end comes out of the mercury and the electric current is broken there is a brilliant spark whenever that happens the current then stops in all the springs at once and they no longer tend to contract so the short spring drops its lower end into the mercury once more the current is re-established and once more the springs contract this cycle of events repeats itself regularly and all the springs feel a contractive force repeated at a rate which is governed by the natural vibrations of the smallest spring the actual motion of the springs is not very large and it is convenient to throw their shadows upon a screen so that their movements are considerably magnified it is now clear that such a subdivision as we have pictured is actually occurring in these springs there is a point of rest in the middle-sized spring at one-third of its height from the bottom at two-thirds of the way up the motion is as large as it is at the bottom it is vibrating in three parts each of which is fixed at one end and moving at the other the point which is at rest is called a node in the longest of the springs there are two nodes and the spring is vibrating in five parts thus it is clear that any spring which is fixed at one end and free at the other can vibrate in one three or five or indeed any odd number of parts when i blew the three notes from the short piece of glass tube just now they corresponded to division into one three and five parts the upper notes had three and five times the frequency of the lowest the second and fourth springs are fixed both at top and bottom and can also be made to vibrate through the action of the same short spring when in motion they divide into two and four parts respectively the current passes through the whole length of each spring and if it were not for an iron bar which is put inside the spring in one of the subdivisions there would be no motion because just as many coils of the spring are expanding as are contracting at any one moment the iron bar however so strengthens the magnetic attractions in its own subdivision that on the whole there is a balance of force to make the spring vibrate thus a spring fixed at both ends divides into any even number of parts so also does a spring free to move at both ends such a spring is realized in the double spring before you where the two parts are suspended from a fine cord passing over pulleys in the roof 
it is true that the pulleys by their inertia and friction both very small however somewhat interfere with the full action of the model but it is easy to show the division into two parts if i set one half in motion by pulling it gently at the proper times the other half though untouched takes up an equal motion the two parts being separated by a node in the centre the connecting string at the top does not move perceptibly figure thirty three the two springs are connected by a fine cord running over two aluminium wheels mounted on ball bearings the white balls suspended from the springs are quite light the double spring shows very nicely how a sudden pull at one end starts an extension pulse that runs up one spring and down the other the end of the latter making a sudden jump upwards on its arrival a contraction pulse is returned up the second spring and down the first which shows a sudden dart downwards at its lower end when the pulse gets there another contraction pulse starts out once more and the process repeats itself the double spring as a whole moves in the direction in which the first impulse was given but it moves like a worm alternately stretching out in front and contracting in the rear the pipe which is closed at both ends would be of no use to the musician because none of its energy would get out into the outside air and no one would hear it but the pipe that is open at both ends is very commonly used more often indeed than the pipe that is open at one end and closed at the other here for example is such a pipe simply a plain long glass tube i can blow across one end and start a feeble vibration which you can hear it is much harder to get a strong note from a tube when both ends are open than when one is closed that may be partly because the energy is radiated away too fast when there are two ends to radiate it but i suspect there are more fundamental reasons i get a far better note when i put on a wooden mouthpiece like a whistle and blow through it because the sheet of air is then directed correctly it is now possible to get many notes the lowest note of the tube is given when the tube is vibrating in two parts and since the tube is forty inches long the length of each part is nearly twenty inches the wavelength is therefore eighty inches and the frequency is twelve times eleven hundred divided by eighty or one six five quite a low note it is rather hard to sound the lowest note i must do no more than breathe into the whistle as gently as i can the note is very weak and can only just be heard by blowing a little harder i get a higher note which sounds when the tube divides into four parts each half the length of the former the resultant note is the octave above the first note we obtained by blowing harder and harder the parts become shorter and shorter and the frequency of the notes are successively three four five times as great quite a number of notes can be got from this tube though it would require some practice to be able to strike any desired note without hesitation it is interesting to observe that the frequency which is seven times the fundamental seems out of tune to us because we do not include that note in the musical scale we shall come to this point again there are several other methods of producing musical sounds which we may consider as further illustration of the principles we are considering here for instance is a wooden dulcimer consisting of blocks of wood graded in size and arranged upon two chords they give between them all the notes of the musical scale here again is a set of lengths of bamboo so arranged as to make an instrument from which we may draw music of a kind by stroking with a gloved hand and using plenty of resin this bamboo harp was used by tyndall and is described in his book here again are a set of loose pieces of wood when i throw them down on the table in turn we get once more the musical scale 
we saw just now when we were using the eight wheels and the card that there were certain simple numerical relations between the frequencies of the notes of the musical scale which we employ it is important to realize that we have not chosen these notes because of the simplicity of the relations but that having chosen the notes to suit our tastes and spent centuries in doing so we find that the frequencies of the notes have these relations it is not surprising to find that some peoples have chosen differently for instance the old gaelic scale which is used in some tunes well known to us all had no fourth and no seventh a very easy way to realize it is to use only the black keys of the piano and no white keys f sharp is the keynote and the fourth and seventh to this are c natural and f natural which are not to be played old lang syne for example can be played on the black notes alone some nations like the arabs have still more fundamental differences because they recognize quarter tones equal to half the smallest difference of our own scales there is one very curious matter which i should like you to consider for a moment let us suppose we were making up an instrument consisting of all the different notes required we start by putting together one set of notes beginning let us say with a keynote having a frequency of two five six we find then that we must have others as follows two five six c two eight eight d three two o e three four one and a third f three eight four g four two six and two thirds a four eight o b five one two c the numbers are in the same proportion as the teeth on the eight wheels which gave the musical scale so far so good but we want to be able to play music in more keys than one musicians depend on being able to change over from one key to another in order to get certain effects suppose that we arrange that it shall be possible to play also in the key of d we must therefore provide a set of notes whose frequencies shall bear to two eight eight the same proportion that those already provided bear to two five six i will write these down under the others two five six two eight eight and beneath it two eight eight three two zero and beneath it three two four three four one and a third and beneath it three six o oh three eight four and beneath it three eight four four two six and two thirds and beneath it four three two four eight o oh, and beneath it four eight o oh. five one two and beneath it five four o oh, and five seven six we then find that arithmetic is too much for us not that we cannot do the sums but that the results we get cannot be reconciled with our capacities for building instruments the note which we have made to be the third in the c scale is not quite right for the second in the scale of d and the problem at once arises shall we provide a new pipe or string or shall we make the old one do or shall we adopt some middle course and again a little farther along the row we find the note three six o oh, which is nowhere near f or g and we learn why it has been found necessary to put in a new note called f sharp which is played on the piano by a black key there is a new note of frequency four three two which is nearly the same as a and also a note of five four o oh, which is about halfway between c and d and the origin of another of the black keys on the piano we are therefore in trouble the moment we try to provide the notes required for any large number of different keys several solutions of the difficulties have been proposed which are based on the plan of providing new notes in the worst cases and putting up with those we can manage to endure 
for example we might have decided that we could not afford room for two strings or pipes of frequencies three two o and three two four respectively and have contented ourselves with one of frequency three two two which would have to do duty for both the others but we should be compelled to provide new notes at three six o and five four o because it would really be impossible to make one or other of the old notes do instead but the particular compromise would be unsatisfactory because we have not only the keys of c and d to consider but many others as well the general solution which is now adopted is a very drastic one it amounts to supplying five new notes the black keys in addition to the white and so tuning all the notes that we can play equally well or we might say equally badly in all the keys there are twelve intervals in the octave c to c sharp c sharp to d d to d sharp d sharp to e e to f and so on and all are equal the correct intervals with the exception of the octave do not exist on a piano or organ as it is tuned today but the inaccuracies are not large and the ear has grown accustomed to them it is here that the singer or the violin player has such an advantage seeing that he has power to produce a note of any frequency whatever he gets this power in return for the labour of hard practice for his courage in running the dangers of going out of tune and his skill in avoiding them other instruments like the flute are provided with keys which take most of the responsibility from the performer but leave some power of adjustment the flute player can modify his pitch by altering the way in which he blows across the mouthpiece but although this is the modern way of getting over the arithmetical difficulties it is far from being the only one a hundred years ago with the same number of keys as at present five black and eight white in the octave the tuning was so carried out that a certain number of keys were nearly correct the rest were left to take care of themselves wolves they were called because they howled so badly End of lecture two.